Um, hi, everyone. So um, I think the title of my dissertation, my working title, is a little self-explanatory, so I'm going to need to spice it up this year. Um, uh, Basically, I'm doing a, a historical project on cartography, industry, and state formation in Chile's southern frontera, so essentially the Araucanía region between the years 1883 to 1929. Um, so basically, my dissertation is a agrarian and economic history of internal colonization processes in the Araucanía region of southern Chile between, as I said, the years 1883, which is when um, the wars of pacification, quote unquote, ended, and um, 1929, which is when we have kind of this world kind of economic crash, and that affects Chile in some ways. So um, these are the, this is the periodization that I've chosen to focus on. Um, my dissertation project, because unlike Danielle's project, all of my subjects are dead. Oh. So uh, I will, and because I lack social skills, I will be, <laughs> I will be um, focusing primarily um, on using archival sources, so in the archives, uh, to understand the ways in which the mapping and kind of parceling of this particular territory by the Chilean state and its engineers led to an encroachment on indigenous land practices. So the way that the state kind of told indigenous people, this is how you need to live, this is uh, the amount of people that can live in a certain house, for example. So the many ways in which the state began to encroach on their lifestyle, the amount of livestock that they could have in one place, how they needed to be kind of parceled, how they needed to be fenced, things like that. Um, so these practices, as you might imagine, had profound consequences on these communities who in many cases were displaced from their homes. So I'm talking um, illegal land grabs, if you will. Um, I have records of these indigenous communities showing up to a um, Chilean kind of minister's office and saying, hey, you know, we've been here for hundreds of years. I mean, this is all we know. Um, yes, we do migrate back and forth between the Cordillera, but, you know, this is our home. And they have said, well, someone showed up with a slip that says they own your house, so you got to move out. So these are the, the processes that I'm looking at. How does this happen? Why does this happen? Um, how does the Chilean state, through its engineers, through its land sales, enable this process to happen? So I'm looking at the way in which the mapping of this territory also had a significant impact on the land itself. So how was the land commodified? How do we give land a price? Who do we sell it to and with what purpose? So. In order to do this, I'm looking at three sites. So I'm looking at Angol, Temuco, and Concepcion. Um, and my project is essentially looking at the way in which the region was developed for exploitation at a national and global scale. So each of these sites is going to reveal the different ways in which the development of infrastructure, the growth of cities, as well in the case of Temuco, the growth of cities, and trade in the region was intricately tied to its exploitation by the state. So. My initial hypothesis right now that I think might change is that the economic development of the Araucanía, a process that was largely divorced from the interests of the local inhabitants, so the Mapuche peoples primarily, uh, served as a violent and prolonged means of conquest that was repeated well beyond the initial period of occupation. Um, so people have written about this before. This isn't the first time we hear about Mapuche kind of land issues and disputes and things like that. but. Um, a lot of the studies that I have found have used ethnographic approaches, so it's been mainly anthropologists that have gone down and spoken to the communities now and said, how did your grandparents experience this? How are you experiencing this now? What, how is this period of colonization still impacting your life today? And my work is mainly using land grants, land sale records, maps, and other government documents to kind of illustrate the ways in which nation building in this region kind of becomes synonymous with the growth of territory and the growth of industry. So now we get to talk about the, the very glamorous life of a historian. Um, so I have been here before. I came uh, in 2015 and I did a six week kind of exploratory research trip to Santiago and Concepcion. And I have developed a research plan that essentially begins with the initial phase of eight months at the Archivo Nacional in Santiago, which is just down the street on Miraflores. And it houses sources that essentially are crucial to the completion of my project. So thanks to Pinochet, a lot of this information is 
centralized in Santiago, and, you know, this is where many historians go because a lot of the information is just there, you know, for better or worse, it's the way the archives are set up. So um, I have the fun job of from nine to five reading the kind of hieroglyphs that is 19th century Chilean handwriting from bureaucrats, and, you know, it is kind of, <laughs> you know, it, is a, it can be a bit of a tedious process, but um, basically what I'll be looking at are documents related to land sales and correspondence between engineers and government officials that are going to give me an understanding of the mechanisms of land distribution and the ways in which local and central government institutions were involved in these processes. So it definitely was not a seamless transition between these areas being formerly Mapuche and now belonging to the Chilean state, you know. Um, even What I have found is that even local settlers who came in and said, oh great, we have all this land now, um, there was a lot of problems in that set, in that settling process because it is a new area. There isn't a lot of resources. It's just kind of, in some ways, a bit of a no man's land for them because there's things like outbreaks of smallpox and vaccines take like two months to come and by the time they come it's almost like a little epidemic there. So it is kind of a, it's a rough process for kind of everyone involved. Local bureaucrats run out of money, um, rural police doesn't have much money, there's reports of banditry, reports of violence, you know, we're dealing with things like that, along with the, of course, larger displacement of indigenous communities. So I will also be looking at the everyday kind of practices of land surveying in the region through correspondence between engineers in the Araucanía and in the central government of Santiago. So one of the people that I focus on, his, he's an engineer, he's a German engineer by the name of Teodoro Schmidt, and he's largely in charge of mapping the region as a whole. And a lot of what I found in the correspondences are what is his vision for what the land should look like, how should it be mapped. And one of the important points that he makes, and I'm going to try to explore this here, is he says, surveyors, when you're out in the land, when you're out kind of doing your sketches or whatever you're doing, don't talk to indigenous people. Like, don't have any dealings with them in any way. And I have been thinking about for three years, I've been thinking, why is he saying that? So this is the question that I'm kind of hoping to, to answer this year. So I hope that curiosity will be satisfied. Um, I'll also be looking at records from the Ministry of Hacienda, which will kind of further reveal how do these changes in ownership take place and what's kind of the process behind that. So my preliminary research, as I said, has shown that most of the territories have been used for agriculture and livestock grazing, although I've also found documents reflecting some foreign interests, mainly British interests, in developing mining sectors and the potential growth of the steamship industry. So this is also something that I'm trying to look at, is what is kind of the international impact of the colonization of this region? So I have found documents from the Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores, where it's British mining companies writing to, you know, the Chilean government in Santiago and saying, hey, um, are you going to be done building that railroad because we're trying to build a mining company there? So they actually had a lot of clout and a lot of say in how this region was developed. And I'm trying to look at these links a little further this year. Um, so while a lot of my research is kind of you know, in the Biblioteca Nacional. Some of it will also be in the Mapoteca Nacional. And this is where I'll be able to kind of corroborate what these engineers are talking about amongst themselves and to look at the actual maps that they were producing, right, and how they envisioned the land use. So not everything is in Santiago. <laughs> um, I will be spending a month in Temuco, which kind of houses the Archivo Regional de la Araucanía. And this is a particularly interesting place because not everything is cataloged. There are boxes and boxes that have not been cataloged. <laughs> and from what I've heard from friends that have gone down there is that it can be a bit of a treasure trove because there's a lot of documents pertaining to indigenous peoples who kind of get together with their communities and say, you know what, um, they're going to try to kick us off our land, so we're going to file a lawsuit. And one of the things that I would like to look at is how they argue kind of back and forth and how do they justify their kind of existence there. So how do they, what are the ways in which they themselves become, you know, agents of what is happening around them and, um, and when they are displaced, if and when they are displaced, where do these communities end up? Because I mean, to travel from kind of the south to Santiago, 
is kind of an expensive and kind of a tedious process. So one of the things that I'm starting to look at now is also labor in this area. How does labor develop? So where do they end up working? And what I'm beginning to find is that many of these communities are not only displaced, but then end up working for the very companies that have displaced them. So these are some of the um, these are some of the things that I'm going to be looking at this year, and I'm hoping to answer some of the questions that I posed today. Thank you. I don't know if you mentioned, but um, what is the significance of like those exact dates that you? Oh, yeah. So the dates that I chose. So 1883 was kind of the, kind of marks the end of what they referred to as the quote unquote wars of pacification. Yeah. So it was kind of when the Chilean state kind of really consolidated military control over the territory. I mean, they had slowly been making the push for some time, but this is really when they get control of the territory. Oh, okay. And, and, for, and, I, and today, do um, the land that has been taken from the indigenous peoples, is there any like a movement? I mean, I'm sure there's movement, but has it been successful at all in like, them reclaiming their land, or not really? Not really. I think. Um, I think things have gotten progressively worse, if I'm being very honest. <laughs> yeah. um, so you mentioned earlier that um, this, you know, it's a very like archival project. Mm -hmm. um, I get like working with people who are still alive is very hard. <laughs> um, I'm, more, I'm wondering how much you are engaging with I, either with like ethnographic texts mm -hmm. or like other scholars mm -hmm. who are like doing ethnography in these regions. Like how much of that is part of your like broader set of references. So this is one of the advantages of being here for nine months and not six weeks is that I am able to make these connections, particularly in the South, which is what I'd like to do. I know there's a lot of scholars who in the South who are still engaged with these communities mm -hmm. who, you know, even though my research is not ethnographically based, I think it would still be an amazing frame of reference to kind of know how these communities are still kind of conceptualizing territory. Totally. Um, I guess I was wondering, like, how candid are the sort of archival documents like if you're looking at things that were written by bureaucrats sort of how much is it kind of like posturing versus how much are they like when you were talking about things like the smallpox breakout like how much of are they sort of being I mean I guess honesty is sort of like a multifaceted yeah. thing but how sort of honest are they being about at least their experience of what is going on and this is kind of one of the interesting things about just working in the humanities and human beings in general, right, is how honest are you in a particular document, especially if you're a bureaucrat, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it is kind of an imperfect science, so I think this is where kind of being a little more interdisciplinary helps a lot, and trying to, you know, unfortunately we can't interview these indigenous peoples and ask them, you know, what did you really think, but to try to these documents are kind of imperfect sources in that sense, right? Um, I have found that some of the bureaucrats in the South have been surprisingly candid about how annoyed they get. You know, they said, you promised us money a month ago, or something even more urgent, you promised us vaccines and we're, we're dying. So um, these are, you know, they do, once the necessity goes up, you know, people start to get very honest about what they need. But as I said, archival documents in themselves are an imperfect science. I mean, they're being read by multiple government officials, so there's multiple filters and sensors that we do need to keep in mind when we do this work. This is so outside of the scope of your project, so I apologize. Okay. <laughs> but are you, in, are you seeing any connections between sort of what's going on in the region with the protests now? Or like, is there, is there, are, are there any echoes or what are you, what are your reflections on that? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think some of the same questions that were raised in 1883 that I have found in the documents are being raised today. And it's unfortunate that we don't have an answer to them. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're all getting a little restless, but there's two things I'd like to do before we go on.